No, it's some kind of idiot. Welcome back to the Lakeshore Project. In this video, part one of two, we're going to get into laying out lap siding, installing lap siding, pre-assembling window trim, the corrugated fastener tool. So let's get into it. Don't kick me in the face. Okay. Want me to count it down or you? Yeah, you do count it down this time. Three, two, one. Did I hit your hand? Ah, uh, foot. <laughs> we typically side three sides of our house with eight inch LP smart side lap siding at a six inch reveal. So what I always do is I hook the bottom of my sheeting about even with the mudsill and I mark six inches. That's a top mark. Then I go ahead with my little one by two that's already laid out six inches and I go ahead and I mark up the wall. What this automatically does is it burns two inches of siding down over the mudsill. So that joint is covered by two inches of siding. Then about eye level, I go ahead and I level a mark over, I write a CP for control point, and I tack a nail right through the house. This is now going to determine the coursing around the entire house, or at least everywhere that we put on the lap siding. So this is that same corner, but on the inside of the house, obviously. So what I'm measuring from is the top of the bottom plates. I'm gonna to measure to the center of that nail. I'm gonna write that on the wall. Now all I have to do at all of my outside and inside corners is butt the bottom plates, measure up whatever that mark is, and tack a nail out. So that's what I'm about to do here in the back of the living room. Typically for us, our floor is gonna be the best reference point all the way around the building until we get to the garage. But that's easy enough to transfer. Now you can measure down from top plates over there. Basically, here's our thinking. We do our own concrete work and we use the laser to establish grade. We know our concrete is flat because when we anchor down our mud sill, we're gonna eyeball all of that. Every time we pull out a laser, we're within an eighth of an inch all the way around. That is more than good enough in my book for siding. We never install siding with a laser unless for some reason we got pulled off the job and we have to come back later and the house is already drywalled. So I tack out one nail and then I just level to the corner with my four or six foot level. Now I just use my little story pole. By the way, even though six inch spacing is probably the easiest thing on earth to do on a tape, because you measure one foot and then the six and then two foot and then the six. Like in other words, there's no math, there's no memorizing. I find for me personally that a one by two that's already been laid out is just faster because there's just no thinking. You just go and you mark them. So what I'm doing in this case is I'm going around the entire building. I'm tacking those nails from the inside out. Now here's the corner opposite of where I just was. I'm going to level to the corner. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm laying out all of my exterior corners. Now, if you're thinking, Aren't you gonna cover that with corner boards? Hang with me. I'll show you how we install corner boards toward the end of this video. Since this same mark at the nail is my control point, I always write CP for control point. And as often as I can, I go ahead and I snap from outside to outside or outside to inside corners, just like I'm gonna do here. Now this is before we've hung the sliding glass door, mostly because it was back ordered. Now I have that layout on both sides of the slider, even after we tape the nailing pins, after we trim it, all that good stuff, my layout is already established. So here I'm just gonna do the exact same thing along the kitchen, and now that's the back of the garage where I'm at. I didn't get video of it, but what I'm gonna do is tack a nail on the inside of the garage, and then I can use the top plates on the inside of the garage to transfer layout. So essentially our, uh, our level lines were established when we built our foundation and then our mud sill. So there's no sense in reinventing the wheel. Now, if you're in a remodel situation, always go parallel to your eaves because some old houses have settled. You don't want level siding on an unlevel house. Rather, you want it to be parallel. Otherwise, everybody's eye just goes to it as there's something seriously wrong. We found over the years that it's better for one person to do all of the layout. No numbers get, trans well, at least the likelihood of numbers getting transposed goes down. He gets into a rhythm, then he's responsible for it. There's just less in communication errors as well. 
So in this case, it was on me. Kyle's out doing some other kind of prep. He might be cutting window trim, whatever the case is, getting otherwise organized. Sometimes I just pop out and do this when we're pickup framing because it's just a good time to do it. So here's that control line or control point snapped all the way across. I typically will snap lines for about anything over 12 feet. And you'll see that as the video goes on. LP Smart Side, it's 3 8 lap siding. It's an engineered wood product. It is not perfectly straight. So when you hang it on the wall, you'll see how you kind of have to adjust. A lot of times I nail from one end, go to the middle, and then go to the other end and nail all the way through but you're always adjusting it. So I find that for me personally, like in this case behind the master bedroom wall, it's easier to just snap all of the lines. It only takes a second, and we just try to simplify things as much as possible for when we actually install the lap. Now in this case, that big rake wall that you saw in the previous videos, it's like 44 feet long or something. So I stretch a dry line all the way through, I go to the middle with my speed square and I push up an eighth of an inch to account for the sag. Mark the wall, now that's all I'm doing here, is I'm marking my layout. So how do you snap a line on a 44 foot long wall with no sag? Well, I'm glad you asked. So what I'm doing is snapping from each end to the control point. Now I'm gonna tack nails at each of those lines. This is the middle of the wall, so about 21 feet, 22 feet in. Did I say it was 44 feet? So that would be 22 feet in. I tack nails along a stud, because I'm not gonna pull these nails, I'm gonna drive them flush. If I pull the nails, then technically I should really patch that hole. I don't really wanna patch that hole. Now I use the same nail, I run out my chalk line to my far left, snap a line, as I walk past, I roll it up, and I just keep going to the other end. And so essentially now I'm only snapping 22 foot long lines, which I'm very confident are nice and straight. And I just walk back and forth across the building, um, probably to like maybe a layout two or above my eye level, depending on how far I can reach. And that's good enough. After we get that high, we're either gonna set up planks or work off of a staging platform with our forklift or some other form of scaffolding. So when it comes to the LP lap siding, being that we're framing 24 inches on center, we make all of our staggers in the butt joints four feet. Now what that does for us is that if I cut four feet off of a 16 footer, I have a four foot starter and I have a 12 foot piece. I cut eight feet, I have two eights. So we start with a 16, then a 12, then an eight, then a four. So what Kyle does is he's already pre-cut those for me. He helps me get the first one going. After that, I can just use the gecko gauge to hold 16 footers. By the way, this is very lightweight siding, so with gecko gauge, nice and simple for one person. Now Kyle, his job, see he just cut another batch and he's staging those for me. So now that we've staggered back from left to right, I'm gonna bring 16s back. As Soon as I get to that 16, I already have my 12, my eight, and my four. And because we're getting two eights out of every 16, he really only needs to cut that every other batch. So we stagger from the far right, that's where our layout started. And then I can essentially work alone until we get to a certain height or it makes sense for Kyle to jump in and help me. In the meantime, he's my cut man. Either I'm gonna write numbers down or if he's close enough, he's just gonna measure them and now he can stay ahead. That's just the way that we found to be efficient. I'll put a link in the description for these gecko gauges, siding gauges. We don't use them as gauges. We use them as basically a second pair of hands. 16 footers, you could technically hang by yourself, but because we're trying to eyeball that 3 eighths of an inch gap, uh, 3 eighths, 3 sixteenths inch gap. LP warranty requires a 3 sixteenths gap. So that's, that, that's like really important. So that's why that's where I always start nailing. Anyway, I should really be doing an Amazon affiliate because these gecko gauges alone are, are worth the money. I really should start Amazon affiliate links, but anyway, go check the description. I highly recommend these if you're putting on lap siding. You can buy them in 5 16 uh, thickness for Hardy, or in this case, 3 8 for LP.
You might be wondering to yourself, it sure seems like there's a lot of back and forth. Why don't you just start from right at the butt joint and work to the left and keep it straight all the way? It's because some of these boards, and I think you'll see one here in a little bit, when it comes to keeping these things straight, sometimes they'll curl one inch above or below the line at the far left. So I typically go in like thirds or half, tack it, and then I can work back bailing it. So there you can see I kind of went to the middle. Yeah, that guy, you see how much that had to move up? Here, I'm gonna replay that for you. As I nail, of course, this is one of the huge advantages in Zip System. Because the house wrap doesn't cover my studs, I know that wherever I have tape is a butt joint, and I can see all of my framing. Remember, way back in an earlier video, we're nailing our king studs, and we're nailing our trimmers, because those are the boundary elements on our shear walls, but also on rake walls, we nail the king and the trimmer all the way up, from bottom plate to top plate. So now as I'm going through a nailing, I can just aim for where our shear nails are. That means that very rarely is nailing just going into sheathing, which by the way is okay, but obviously it's better if we can aim for the studs. So there again, I nail in the end, I go over like six feet, eight feet, whatever it was, tack it, since I'm already there, I can just nail to my right. Now I go to the other end, push it up to the line or down as the case might be, and then finish it off. And as I finish it off, I grab that gecko gauge on my way, go ahead and set it up for the next board, which I know is about four feet shorter. <laughs> I mean, there have been times where I went three feet and then the end of my board missed. So you learn to go like five feet and then, see it's not a gauge, you could use it that way, but it's just a helping hand. My job as the installer is to keep it straight, make sure it's fastened correctly, meets the manufacturer's guidelines, et cetera. Uh, one thing I don't have footage of is that all of these 3 16 butt joints, they get caulking. That is the LP warranty in the many, many years that we've been installing this. The caulking holds great. We use quad or quad max. My preference is OSI quad max at butt joints. By the way, here's a trivia question for you. Why do we caulk butt joints? In this case, it's a 3 16 gap. The other sidings are different. Why are we caulking those? It's not to keep the rain out. Obviously, it's good to keep the water out or the weather. But in reality, its primary function is to keep UV away from your weather resistive barrier on the backside where it can break down. And that's why when you go and you rip lap siding off old houses, like really old houses and you rip the cedar off, you never find rot at the butt joints. You primarily find it around eaves where there's a lack of kickout flashing tops at the bottoms of windows and corners, but not at the butt joints. So anyway, little factoid for you that is worth the price of admission being free. Obviously though, we want to use a high quality sealant. Um, you'll see in a future video on another project, we've since replaced this detail. We no longer use caulking, but we use pan flashing like we used to use with fiber cement, but we don't caulk anymore. And we butt our, pan, or our lap siding just a little bit tighter. And basically those joints disappear. All you have to do in that case is an extra layer of paint on the factory primed butt ends. Anyway, huge digression. For the first row of the siding all the way around the house, we rip one inch pieces. Out of a full length board, you can very quickly rip one inch. And then we don't measure any of that to fit. We just nail them, tack them to the bottom. That's why you'll see me break them toward the end. It just kicks the bottom out like all the rest of the pieces. Now Kyle's job as my cut man is to try and just keep me in motion. And that sounds a lot easier when you're around a sliding glass door. He just counts pieces, as you can see, and then it's my job to install them. Now once again, I will mention there are no corner boards yet. Oh, you can kind of see the one in the distance there on the far right. I'll show you at the end of the video how we install our corner boards. Uh, 
again, I should have links to this stuff. This is, in this video, is like a huge plug for little giant ladders. The model that you see me standing on right there, leaning against the house, which is legal for these ladders, but not your regular step ladders. I reviewed this model way back in like summer of 2019 for the Journal of Light Construction. Its stent sense was stolen. I promptly went to Lowe's and bought two more. Partly because we can lean them against the wall, but as you're gonna see here in just a moment, I can also extend that. So when it comes to siding, especially on a one-story house, these little giant ladders are perfect because they can get us all the way up to the eaves very quickly without any kind of scaffolding. Once you're on the ladder, you just work your way up. It's not like you're up and down, up and down, up and down. Something worth noting too is that even though it's Kyle's job to keep me in siding, it's also my job to keep him in numbers. So I can give him numbers for around that hose bib block. While he's cutting that, I can keep installing in front of me. Obviously there's room for improvement, and thank you for all the commentators who have to keep telling me that you guys must be on the payroll instead of piecework. Well, as I mentioned earlier, this is a spec home that we're building. We work for Pioneer Builders, and we do the foundations, the framing, the siding. We do other people's jobs. So yeah, we are on the payroll. We are not specialized siders. So we're not gonna be as fast as some of you who specialize in it, but we have to do everything. So is there room for improvement? Yes. Speaking of improvement, how about if I don't forget the light block as I go? So yep, two steps forward, one step back. Easy enough, just pop off a couple pieces, cut in the light block, which by the way, Kyle already had. It, it, that was 100% my fault. What we like to do is align the light block with the coursing. So once we get up to that course, then we go ahead and go, hey, there's a light block, don't forget. So the reason why we do it that way, instead of installing it when we trim everything else like the windows, is we want the bottom of the light block to be even with the bottom of a course of siding, and we want the bottom of a course of siding to go directly over the light block. And you'll see that here in just a moment. So normally, we put the light block on as we go, and we can align it. So you can see how, yep, we put the metal on the top, we go ahead and tape it, always roll your tape, and then now Kyle can cut those little pieces. I will install them correctly. And hey, we're back in business. Who doesn't make mistakes? Besides the people who comment on YouTube and Instagram. <laughs> those people are perfect. I don't know if you guys knew that, but people who comment, they're the fastest, the best, and the most perfect. Just ask them. We always snap a line for that piece that goes above the window or the door, or in this case, sliding glass door. Because as you cut up and around the window, the siding itself can get a little swirly. So if we have a straight snap line, then we can just adjust it and nail it as we go so it's nice and straight.
so you get a sense for how we work together. There's some overlap. It's each tries to anticipate the other. I don't want Kyle to have to stand there waiting for me to give numbers. He doesn't want me to have to stand there waiting for him to cut me boards. So whatever it takes to kind of keep that in perpetual motion, then that's what it takes. You might be wondering too, what siding guns are we using? We're using the Makita high pressure siding guns. Now my preferred framing gun of course is the max high pressure and we've been running max high pressure since 2008. But I reviewed the little Makita high pressure siding gun for JLC a few years back. So the gun we had for review, we just loved it. The thing weighs like three or four pounds. So we just bought another one. A friend of ours who's a welder made us some custom aluminum hooks so that they can hook left or right. I prefer to use a gun left-handed. Kyle prefers to use it right-handed. Doesn't matter because the hook goes both ways. I'll tell you when we're hot. Okay. We're hot. I like being hot. Oh. This is the Pack Tool Gable Scribe made by the same people that make the Gecko Gauge. It's actually for fiber cement siding to use with shears. But we bought one years and years ago because it's super quick to get your angles. And with the extra long arm, it works great doing shingles too, uh, wood sidewall shingles. You might be wondering to yourself, you guys are really cutting window trim with your framing saw? Yep. There is no advantage to me of pulling out a miter saw for 99% of the work that we do. It's all square cut, you should be able to <laughs> you should be able to cut square, by the way. Now, what's new for us is the Spot Nails Corrugated Fastening Tool. This thing's awesome. It's pretty inexpensive. Again, I'll put a link below. And yes, I don't make any money off those links. I really need to change that. It's pretty cheap. The box of corrugated fasteners will probably last us a year. Essentially, we're going way faster than pocket screwing. We don't need this to be like a lifelong connection. What we need it to be is nice and flat and strong enough to walk it over and hang it on the wall and then nail it to the wall. So there, I, for me personally, there is no advantage in biscuiting or pocket screw, especially with the LP trim. It doesn't, it doesn't cup or warp on a wall and it doesn't really move. We've been using this stuff for over 10 years. None of it moves. And we regularly go back to those homes, by the way, because our families live in some of those homes. So as you can see, it's a 6050 window. I made it around front, carried it around the back, and I go ahead and nail it off. We'll do a future video. Actually, there is a video on my feed that gets into it in a little bit more detail. If there are large windows, carry them with two people. I know a couple guys that, well, me, tried to carry it by myself and the whole thing crumbled because I tripped over something. So it goes really fast, by the way. You can take all of your window measurements and you can pre-cut and do this all inside on a rainy day or a hot day and do it all in the shade and it's ready to go. At the same time, you get your top measurement for your metal flashing. So you can save a ton of time and it's only like a $200 gun. So this is one of those rare times where you save a lot of time for very little upfront cost. This is what we're using to stitch up our exterior window trim so that we can prefab. It's the Spot Nails X-Ray 1 Charlie 1016 and it shoots corrugated fasteners. Here's what those look like. And those hold those joints crazy strong. Mostly these are used for furniture building, but since we square cut all of our exterior window trim, this will stitch it up so we can prefab it. Pretty cool, huh? 
It's new to me. I don't know who suggested this a while back, but anyway. Honestly, and again, we're gonna sound like heathens. I just use the garage floor because I can really push hard on those joints to make them nice and flat. Or we do it inside on the subfloor. Uh, I don't wanna build a table big enough. I did it for the sake of the video just to show how it all worked. But this is how we do most of it. We bend over to frame walls. So for like what this house had 10 windows, you know, big deal. It's just not very much work. Just um, when you take your measurements, give yourself an eighth of an inch all the way around on the window as a minimum and a quarter inch as a maximum. Uh, your windows, uh, vinyl windows can flex just a little bit in the heat and cold. So you want just enough gap, uh, but you don't want a huge gap that you have to fill with sealant. So the first time I built this window, I tripped and I just demolished the whole thing. The second time, <laughs> the second time I was like, hey Kyle, can you help me? So naturally, this being the first time that we had ever prefabbed our windows with a corrugated fastener gun, we thought, well, hey, instead of just one window, can we pre-install for four windows and do the entire living room set of windows at one time? You tell me. Actually, this would be a good poll. Do you think Awesome Framers has enough trim skill <laughs> or tape measure skill to actually pre I can hold it, you can get on that ladder. Just don't lean it against the... Okay, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're good. Okay, so maybe... Um, so how are you on the bottom? Well, I think that's where all of our gapping is what I'm wondering is if I go like this yeah keep holding it your gun oh wait hold on I'm gonna let me flex my calf nice all right so I have a quarter gap here okay how are you Similar. Okay. I think it is what it is. We just go with quads. Okay. Definitely I can, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay. I think we're cool. Yeah. I think I could probably. And I almost forgot. Here is how we install our corner boards. We nail them together and they go on over the siding. That is a warranty detail from LP, by the way. 
Here in the Pacific Northwest, we've been doing this for decades with very good success. So we nail them on over the top, that protects the ends, it means less maintenance for a homeowner. Now some of you might be thinking, what about wind-driven rain that gets in there? Well, there's air behind the corner and behind the siding. So we really have greater drying potential, which is what we want. So we've gone into old buildings to, re to replace the siding. We pull off corners like this. You can see the carpenter's notes from decades ago. So anyway, that's the detail we like to use. And I'm gonna leave it there and we're gonna do a part two because we ended up doing some cedar shingles and some board on board and we'll get into that in the next video, some rain screen. Thank you guys for watching, I really appreciate it. Don't forget this is part of a series that goes all the way back to when we took the trees down on this property. If you haven't seen those videos, go check them out. Thank you, thank you, thank you for watching. Please everybody stay safe, we'll see you in the next video.